Hello, students of statics. This is Dr. Dan Baker. In today's video, we are going to focus on journal bearing friction. Yes, these are the same journal bearings that we talked about back in 3D equilibrium. We talked about ha them having uh, resistant forces, basically coming either perpendicular to the shaft and then also resistant couples, resistance to rotation. So we can see a little picture of one of those right here. Physically, what it would look like, this is actually a 3D CAD rendering of one, um, but we can see there's this inner sleeve and essentially you have a smooth shaft going through the middle okay so no resistance to forces along the length of the shaft but one thing we didn't consider back looking at 3d equilibrium was the friction that could come from one of these bearings now all of the friction that we're dealing with here in the friction chapter of statics is dry friction now, this may be the case where it makes the least sense, honestly, to have dry friction, but we'll start with there. And as you get into fluids and other classes, you can start dealing with the fluid friction if we actually put grease on the inside of this bearing. Okay, so just a reminder here that as we're talking about journal bearing friction, this is going to be dry friction at one contact point. That's one of the reasons that um, putting grease into a bearing makes more sense is because you actually spread out um, the, the heat and the shear that's going on between the two different materials. But in dry friction, we're gonna assume there's one single contact point. All right. So as we look at, we're look at a couple of different scenarios here, in all of these, this is going to be a fixed um, housing. Let's concentrate on the first two here. So a fixed housing, and this is going to be our axle or our shaft here on the inside. Okay. And so if we have a weight applied to our axle, it should make sense that that axle is gonna come down to the bottom of the opening of that bearing and it would require a normal force, right, pushing back up on the axle. Now, as we draw free body diagrams for journal bearings, note that we're always going to draw a free body diagram for the body that has the forces applied. Okay, so fundamentally, because we're applying the force to the axle, we're gonna draw a free body diagram of the axle. There are some problems where we're gonna apply the forces to the bearing or the housing, the outside piece. And in that case, what we typically have there is we'd have a fixed axle and a movable housing around the outside, okay? So here would be our free body diagram. And we, we tend to call this point right here, this contact point, we tend to call it P naught. Okay, so P naught as in indicating that is the neutral contact point. Neutral in this case means that there's no imbalance of moments. Okay, so fundamentally this axle is not currently trying to rotate. It just has a force applied, pulling it downward and the normal force is pushing up. Okay, it's important to find this neutral contact point in order that you find other contact points which are gonna be at impending motion in one direction or the other. Okay, so again, let me put a label on here. This is the neutral moment case. Okay, so number one, neutral moment. Number two, we're going to look at a negative moment, right? Which of course is in the clockwise direction. So instead of just supporting the vertical force coming downward, um, which let's go ahead and add that on here. We also are going to try to rotate this axle. Okay, and again, this is my negative moment. Negative because it's from the right-hand rule. My thumb goes into the screen, wrapped around the direction of that arrowhead. 
Okay, so what happens in this case? Now, noting that we make a fundamental assumption in these computations that even though we draw a little bit different radius between the axle itself and the housing or bearing, um, we actually um, end up ignoring the difference, difference in the radiuses. Okay. Now, another thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I'm going to lighten up my outside fixed housing. I want to still leave it there as kind of an indication line, but we're actually drawing the free body diagram of the blue axle. Once again, draw the free body diagram of the body. The forces are applied, forces and moments are applied to. All right, so we know that if the weight was just coming down and there was no moment here, that the contact point would be right here. So fundamentally, because we have friction between these two surfaces, as we try to rotate this in a negative right-hand rule direction, it will crawl up the inside of this to the right, basically sticking, and tell a point it would break free. Okay, and again, we're going to solve this for at impending motion. I'll give you two different ways to think about the direction of this contact point shift. And I said one of those is going to be to think about the friction sticking and crawling in that direction. Okay, so we said that, let's get that back to blue, that our initial contact point was here, P naught, and we've just moved it over here. Okay, let's call this um, P1. Now I'm gonna add some forces around P1. And so the idea now is that we need a resultant force, right? This is still a static equilibrium problem. And so if you think about some of your forces in the X and Y, it should make sense that you need some kind of a resultant force R, which is parallel to your weight force W, right? Because if you force some of your forces in the X direction and the Y direction, speaking of my X and Y directions, I'm gonna use a standard X, y axes for all three of these free body diagrams so some of my forces in my x and my y things need to balance no forces in the x only vertical forces in the y i also need to balance that moment with wherever i sum my moments about and those two forces so the cool thing now about um, how we solve these problems it turns out that we can create something we call the friction circle now the friction circle is not a physical thing It's really more of a computational tool to figure out where to put this resultant force. And what you can notice here is that the line of action of this resultant force is tangential to that friction circle. The other thing that we know about the friction circle is it has a radius. We're going to call this little r sub little f. And it turns out that r sub f we define as the friction circle radius. And the equation for the friction, cir friction circle radius, and I'll show you where this comes from, is that R sub F is equal to the overall radius R. Okay, so we're saying this is the overall radius of the axle. So this is the overall R times the sine of my friction angle phi sub S. Okay, so that's the same friction angle that we talked about earlier in our friction chapter that phi sub s was equal to the inverse tangent of mu sub s. And the reason that we can use that equation is that, let me go ahead and write in here my, my friction and normal force. Okay, so we know my normal force is always gonna be on a radial line because I have a circular bearing and a normal force is always um, perpendicular to the contact um, surface. The contact surface is tangential, so perpendicular to tangential is radial. We're saying radial basically going through the middle of that circle. And then my friction, which is basically holding this axle up in that direction, would look like this. right? So from the parallelogram law, something close there, we can see that, of course, F plus N equals R. And we know that from before. And we also know that this angle between the, um, let me actually label it here instead of just R, let me go with um, R sub F. That's how we labeled it early in the chapter. We'll stick with that. So this is our friction resultant force. 
And back to our angle here, the angle between normal and the friction resultant force is d sub s. Okay, so it turns out this is also d sub s through this side here. So to see now where this sine function comes in, actually let me draw, redraw, sorry for this, but just need to get things drawn a little more accurately. Let me redraw this r sub f because if my my force, my resultant force is vertical, that's going to hit the this circle right here, um, tangential to the circle. And so if I'm drawing my r sub f as being perpendicular, and this is r sub f is in my friction circle, Sorry about the two R sub Fs, little R sub F and big R sub F. So little R sub F, my friction circle, to this line of action is going to be perpendicular. Okay. And then we also know that our radius, right, the radius of the overall journal bearing is the distance from the center out to point P1. So that would be my R. So now I've created a small right triangle where R is my hypotenuse. I want to know this opposite side over here. Hence, R sub F, my friction circle radius, is the radius of the bearing times sine of P sub S. Okay, that's where things come from. All right, let me show you what would happen if we put a different or the opposite direction moment. Okay, so we still have our neutral contact point here, uh, P naught. So let me move that label off to the side, put it over here. There we go. Um, and so we know the normal force would come through that point if we had no moment, but now we are adding a moment in the other direction, right? This is positive from the right-hand rule. It's also in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, so there's our moment, and we still have our weight force coming through the middle of that axle. Again, we are drawing the free body diagram um, of the um, axle itself as opposed to the bearing on the outside. It's just that this time, that contact point, instead of shifting to the right, you're just going to grab a hold and shift to the left a little bit. Now we're going to use the exact same idea here of this friction circle. So you could draw on here your friction circle. It has a radius r sub f. If we drop a tangential line down to this contact point, we end up with our contact point here. I could call this P2. Again, I have a vertical resultant force. This is my friction resultant R sub big F, um, which is opposing that weight force tangential to the friction circle. Okay, all the same angles, it just shifted to the left versus shifted to the right. Okay, so looking at these three scenarios, what we can see here is we have the um, a neutral moment, we have our negative or clockwise moment, and then we have three, our positive or counterclockwise moment. Okay, so another thing we know is that friction always resists motion. And so you can all, also use this kind of analogy to figure out the motion here. So if we have our moment pushing the middle wheel here in a negative right-hand rule direction, we could say the impending motion of the axle is also negative from the right-hand rule. Okay. Now we talked a little bit about absolute versus relative motion in previous friction topics. We're going to come back to that right now. And so the absolute impending motion of the axle is negative from the right-hand rule. But because we know that um, between connecting bodies, right, so these two bodies are basically touching each other, we have a relative impending motion of that bearing or housing. Now the bearing or housing in this case is not moving, but relative to the moving axle, it's going in the opposite direction, right? Negative impending motion here for the axle, positive right-hand rule impending motion for the housing or bearing. And note that our contact point shifted in the direction of that uh, impending motion of the bearing, of the outside. Okay, so often I talk about on the outside because sometimes we call it a bearing, we call it a housing, we call it a crank, we call it a bunch of different things. But if you wanted to think really simply, you have the inside and you have the outside. Okay, and I'll go through, I'll write that out. It's actually typed out below. You can probably see on the bottom of the screen there some text kind of talking through these steps and that will be written out there.
Okay, so once you create these free body diagrams, then you simply apply whatever equations of equilibrium you would like to about whatever points seem convenient, and you solve for the unknowns. Okay, so this is really all a technique to create accurate free body diagrams for journal bearings. All right, so here are those steps. We just walk through all of these. First, we want to draw the free body diagram of the body that the forces or couples are applied to. Sometimes it's the axle, some, so basically sometimes it's the inside, sometimes it's the outside. It depends on the problem. Second, find a neutral contact point where the moments are balanced. Okay, so if you're if the system has no moments out of balance, it's not going to try to rotate, and fundamentally it will not engage friction. Okay, so let me just add that here to our little list. So we could say if the moments are balanced, we could say that our friction force is equal to zero. No friction will be needed when moments are balanced. This is the friction, once again, this is journal bearing friction, rotational friction at that contact point. Third, we're going to shift the contact point. Okay, so we found this neutral contact point. We call this P naught. We're going to shift that in the direction of the impending motion of the outside body. Sometimes this is relative, sometimes this is absolute. But like I said, you can also think about the whatever's trying to rotate, sticking and rotating in the direction um, that it's trying to rotate. Thir or sorry, fourth, we're going to draw a friction circle around the center of the bearing with a radius of R sub F. Okay, again, we're going to assume that the bearing and the housing have the same radius R in order to do that. And of course, let me complete this here. We, we know that um, R sub F is equal to the radius of the bearing itself times the sine of the friction angle, V sub S. Fourth, pass your friction resultant force R sub F, big R sub F through the contact point on a line of action tangential to the friction circle. And then finally apply your equations of equilibrium. Now we'll see a little bit of this as we move forward, but if you have parallel forces, which we did on this first example, where we had our friction, excuse me, our weight force and our resultant force were parallel, it turns out you can find a direct algebraic equation to solve for those. If you have non-parallel forces, uh, basically if there's forces applied in multiple directions, you will need a numeric solver. And I'll show you how to solve one of those in this next, in the example on this topic. The last thing I want to highlight here is the fact that all three of these cases are fundamentally static. And it turns out that all moments that are between this negative M and this positive M, the system will still be static. Okay, these are your bookend impending motion. So you think about, well, what happens if the moment is less than the impending motion moment? Well, all that's gonna happen there is this contact point is gonna move closer and closer and closer and closer to P naught until at P naught the moment's equal to zero. Okay, same thing over here. Um, for this, I can't grab this one quite as cleanly here. We'll just grab right there. So for smaller moments, and I'm saying smaller as in closer to zero than this negative moment, then that contact point would just be closer there to P naught. Okay, so all three are static and in between the moment here, negative moment and this positive moment, which are the moments which push the system to impending motion, the system would stay static. All right, thanks for your attention on that video, and the next video coming up, we'll look at an example on this topic.